Okay, so um, <clears throat> we have been for several weeks um, getting different ones of you guys to teach, um, to help disciple and train and hopefully send out from here to go wherever God's leading you uh, for, for whatever time period. Pe time period. And um, I had someone for tonight and they had to uh, postpone their time. So it was a short notice, and I thought about calling on Chris and saying, Chris, you got two days. But <laughs> uh, I decided to go ahead and just take it myself. But uh, we are still in um, um, making disciples. We are still in training people to basically, just like Jesus trained the disciples, to do what he did. Um, uh, he, he trains us through his word to, to speak as he spoke, do as he did, love as he loved, um, pray as he prayed. And um, so I want to I go back to one of his first lessons in his very intensive uh, discipleship training program. Uh, I, I call it very intensive because he took 12 people. And he said, I'm going to pour my life into these 12, and I'm going to take three years to do it, and then they're going to kill me, and I'm going to be raised, and, and I'm going to leave them alone, and they're going to be on their own. So you can imagine three years' time. Just think back to when you first got saved. Um, Zach, what year was that? 2024. So in three years from now, you got to be ready to go out into all the world and preach the gospel and teach them to do what all the things that Jesus commands you to do in three years. Now, you might think, I got this, but you don't have it unless you've got the Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus knew and why he told them in John 14, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm going away. But I'm going to send a spirit to comfort you and to teach you. It will lead you and it will, he will lead you and he will guide you into all truth. So you, you, you won't need me physically standing here with you anymore. Um, so God bring the day when we don't need anybody physically standing beside us to prop us up, to help us, to, to tell us what to say, when to say. But we would be able to because we know His Word, and because we have been good students of His Word, that we would just do what Jesus would do. Uh, there was a Sunday, I was reminded of this just a little bit ago, there was a Sunday some years back when my son Travis was um, young, he was probably a teenager or a little older, and um, there was some some situation that arose at church and he was there and they asked Travis what you know what, what, what do you want us to do and he said well I don't know let's think what would dad do <laughs> <laughs> and so sometimes it's just that simple for us uh, I don't know let's think let's pray what would Jesus do what would the Holy Spirit have me do what does his word say you know I, I find myself saying that a lot uh, when faced with a difficult situation, well, what does the Word say? What does God say? What's His heart? Um, and I, I sometimes I know His heart because I know His Word, and sometimes I know His Word because I know His heart, if that makes sense. And so we're going to start where He begins this crash course, and we're going to cover eight simple things that he began his Sermon on the Mount with. Can anybody tell me what those eight simple things were that he began the Sermon on the Mount with? Attitude. Your attitude. What? The, attitude. the Beatitudes. Has a lot to do with your attitude, doesn't it? <laughs> the, what, the, the word Beatitude simply means that you are blessed. You are supremely, more than blessed, you are supremely <laughs> Blessed, meaning you are blessed by a supreme being, a much, much higher, greater power or source than anything um, that this earth has ever known or seen or will ever know or see. 
And so I, if, if I'm blessed by the supreme power, I am really, really blessed. I had a friend years ago, and I copied what he said for a long time because it was, it, was, it was hilarious. But he said, I am one, he was six country as the day is long. I am one blessed rascal. And what he meant, and he was referring to the Beatitudes, I, I'm just, I'm supremely blessed. And so Jesus talks about, and he's telling us, and he's telling his disciples then what it takes to experience this kind of blessing. Now, before we go on, we need to, we, we've looked at the word beatitude. Now let's look at the word blessed. The word blessed, and I wrote it in the margin of my Bible. Um, well, I thought I did. I wrote it somewhere. Let's see. Blessed. The, the Greek word for blessed is markarios. And I'm not a Greek scholar, so if anybody is, um, excuse me for pronouncing it wrong, because I'm pretty sure I did. Uh, the word blessed means markarios. It means to have a blessed life, not um, fleeting happiness. We're not talking about happiness that comes for a season or happiness that comes because of something that happened to you or something you got or something you experienced or something you felt. Not that kind of happiness is all. That is shallow, very, very shallow. This comes from a depth of an enduring joy that no matter... Now, this is important that we catch this so that when we go into the Beatitudes, that no matter what happens to you, you have joy that endures through that circumstance. Now, think of the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Whatever first thing comes to your mind, boy, that was terrible, or that was awful, or that was, you know, worst test, the worst, you know, bad, the worst thing ever taken from me, the biggest loss I've ever had. The worst thing you've ever had happen to you, did you have a joy that was so deep and so grounded that all of that horrible, horrible circumstance could not take your joy? That it endured. It remained. You could, maybe you weren't always smiling. Maybe you weren't always feeling good. Maybe you weren't always excited about what was happening that was horrible because you know it's horrible. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what's horrible that's happening. But no, regardless of what was happening, you had, you had a foundation in you that caused you to be able to have joy uh, that comes from the Father that is not something that makes me happy about what's happening, but, but gives me a peace and a, and, a, and a happiness and a joy that, that I know that I'm going to be okay. And even to the point, and this is, this is stretching it for a lot of us, but even to the point, I'm going to be okay no matter what, even if it takes my life. You think, well, that's the ultimate not okay. But no, it, not, not, not if you know who you belong to and not if you're on that rock and not if you have that joy that even if this takes my life, I'm okay. I'm in a good place. God loves me. We were talking about that a little bit this morning about how can we say, how can one man say, I was saved and, and, and the next man was not saved and I can say it was a miracle, but he lost his life. Why didn't he have the miracle? I can have joy that years ago, according to the people across the street, a tornado came straight toward my house and folded up and went over my house and let down in the creek right over here when my house was back there. That's not my house anymore, but it folded up for about 400 feet. 500 feet and then unfolded and continued massive destruction to the point that some people lost their houses. Was, was I that much favored above them? Or did they do something wrong that I, I did something right? Because No, no, it's in God's providence, in His wisdom, and with His time, and in His infinite knowledge, He knows what each individual needs and he is orchestrating our lives to bring us ultimately closer to him so even if the tornado had taken my house i like to think that i would have still been able to praise him for the rubble 
because God, you, you, you apparently want something else for me or there's something I learned from this or there's something that I gain or glean from this. So help me to see it. Help me to have, help me to be blessed like we're about to read several, several times. Blessed is the man, blessed is the man, blessed is the man. Help me to, to, to have that kind of Marcarios kind of being blessed that I have an enduring joy that is not contingent on the circumstances in my life. Now that's a depth that you need to come to if you're going to be a disciple of Christ. If you're going to be able to talk to people who will ask hard questions like, why would a loving God do X thing? Why would he have let my wife, my mom, my brother, my son, daughter die? Why would he have taken them at this age? Why did they have to suffer? If you're going to be able to answer those kind of questions, you're going to be able to know what I'm talking to you about tonight. If you're going to be able to answer them correctly. A lot of people out there answering them incorrectly. And they're giving people false information and false hope. You know, God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have everything. He wants you to be able to pray in the name of Jesus and you get everything you ask for. And, and if, if you rebuke Satan and nothing bad's going to come to you. You know, that's just, those are just half-truths and half lies. And we, we have to be able to discern the difference. And Jesus helps us with that here. So let's get into it. Chapter 5 of the book of Matthew. And we'll just start in the first verse where he says, When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began teaching to teach them saying. So right, right here is like, this begins the three years intensive training program that I'm going to make you my disciples. I'm going to make you like I am. And if we adhere to this and follow this, he's making us like he is, which is the single most important thing you could do with your time here on this planet, by the way. And verse um, three begins. The poor in spirit are blessed. Now, I have the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so yours may say, blessed is he that is blah, 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 or something, you know, King James or whatever version you have, but it, it, they're, they're, they mean the same thing. The poor in spirit are blessed, for the kingdom of God is theirs. The poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? Can anybody tell me what poor in spirit is? Depression. Depression. Mm. Not not necessarily depression, Randy, but that's a good a, a, a good stab at it. Brokenness, brother Ken. Mm -hmm. To have poor in spirit is literally to have a deep, profound need for God. To have a deep, profound, even recognition that I have a deep, profound need for God. That without Him. I'm undone. Without Him, I'm in real trouble. Without God in my life, working on my behalf, leading me, guiding me, teaching me, without Him doing this for me, I'm lost. I don't have a chance. Now, if, if that's what I truly believe from the depth of my heart, I am poor in spirit. I qualify for being poor in spirit. I realize that I'm poor. I realize I don't have anything to offer. I realize I don't have anything to bring to the table. Right? I'm poor. I don't have anything. I had a guy ask me one time. He liked me. I worked for him. And he said, uh, I want to sell you my company. And I said, I'm waiting on payday on Friday, man. I don't know how I could possibly buy your company. I, I was poor in finances. You know, so, so if we're poor in spirit, we don't have what it takes to do the good things. We don't have what it, we, we don't, we don't, we just, we can't do it. And when, but when I recognize that, and when I have a deep and profound recognition of my extensive need for God, because I am just that incapable and undone and without, then I am poor in spirit. And the word says, when I'm that way, I'm blessed. When I'm that way, I have a life that is extremely blessed and I will gain a joy that is unshakable. 
You see, for the man who's arrogant, the woman who's arrogant or cocky or think they have it all together or think that they don't need God, and there's a lot of them out there, for that one who thinks, well, I got this or I'll be all right or maybe one day or whatever, kind of like King Agrippa when Paul was talking to him, almost you persuaded me, Paul, but I'm okay right now. Come back another day, maybe. For that person, they won't have the enduring joy that will get them through the, the, the terrible trials that will come in your life. They won't have it. They won't, they won't be able to survive. They'll fall into that depression like you're talking about, Randy. They'll fall into hopelessness. They'll fall into despair. They'll fall out of faith. I love, I love it when Jesus told Peter, and, and we've referred to this many times here, but when he told him, Peter, I got something to tell you. You ain't really going to like it. Now I'm paraphrasing. I'm, this is this is Cotton Town version. You ain't really gonna like it, Peter. But Satan wants to sift you. And I told him it's okay. I'm sure Peter's like, do what? <laughs> he wants to sift you, and I'm gonna pray that your faith don't fail. Well, well, well. Hold up, Jesus. Let, let, can we tweak that just a little bit? Can you just pray that Satan don't sift me? How about we start there? <laughs> No, I'm going to pray that you go through the sifting, but I'm going to pray that your faith doesn't fail. You see, Peter knew that he was poor in spirit. He knew he didn't have anything to bring to the table. He knew he was undone and, and most desperately needed Jesus in his life and needed God in the way that Jesus was showing him and teaching him who the Father was. And Jesus knew that Peter, though his name meant the rock... <laughs> He needed the rock, the bedrock. He needed something that gave him that foundation for his joy where it couldn't go any further down. It couldn't be shaken. An unshakable joy that no matter what happens or for how long it happens. And sometimes things can happen for a long time. Sometimes they happen in a day and it's over and you've got the fallout to deal with. Sometimes they happen today and tomorrow, next day, and next week, and next month, and next year, and the year after that, 10 years after that. And you're dealing with the fallout every single day of your life for a really, really long time. That's when you need to know that you're blessed. That's when you really have to have this markarios. You have to have this kind of blessing in your life. And if you're poor in spirit and you realize you desperately need him and cannot do it on your own and you're seeking him with everything that's in you on a daily basis you will have it he guarantees us that doesn't he Ashley he guarantees us he, he just said it right here the poor in spirit are blessed for the kingdom of heaven is theirs you'll understand the kingdom of heaven it belongs to you you, you, you will be able to you, you inherit it it's, it, it's, it's part of your, your, your right that comes to you then the kingdom of heaven is what? Not the streets of gold, not stuff we get, not goodies. It's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of heaven literally is. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So he's promising to give you, through your trials, if you have a, a, a recognition of a profound need for him, he's promising to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, so to speak, and let you understand and have what true righteousness, true joy, and true peace really is through, and it will endure through your entire life, all the trials, all things, and you won't be able to be knocked off course. Now that is the definition of eternal salvation. You see, there is such a thing as eternal salvation, but it's not what some think. It's not just because I said something a few years ago, now I can never be lost. It's because I've done something years ago and put my, put my stakes into someone years ago that will cause me to never be able to be lost. It's a big difference, it's a big difference. All right, so let's go a little further. I'm gonna go a little longer than some of you guys go, but <laughs> I'm gonna try to finish up by eight o'clock. The, uh, no, Ashley. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 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 
Those who mourn are blessed. Those who mourn are blessed. Mourn is when I am sensitive to the needs and the sufferings of other people. Are you sensitive to the needs and the sufferings of other people? Does it, do you see suffering? Do you see somebody really going through something tough? And does it, does it hurt you? Does it break your heart? Does it cause you to weep? Does it, does it draw you to your knees and you, you spend some time talking to the Father about them? Does, does compassion well up in you? So then, then you're mourning. Blessed are those who mourn. That's what that means. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Again, you're going to find that peace, the peace that we were talking about just a minute ago, you're going to find that peace as you mourn and as your heart breaks for those that you see in suffering and as you go to the Father on their behalf, not only will they be taken care of by a faithful, just Father, but you'll be comforted as well. You'll find peace. You'll find a place where you can be okay. You, you'll, find, um, you'll find that some hope for the, those people. And you'll have some courage to, to well up in you. And, and Chris, you know what I'm talking about. I see the look on your face. It's like... I, I see you, I see you still, you're still there, but I know you're going to be okay. And I'm at peace with that. I know my father is on the scene. He's on a job. We've, we've involved him now. And, and, th- and this is what, this is going to be a good outcome. And I've said to, to many of you many times over the years when, when you've been in terrible places, and I would say, I would call it a good place. You're in a good place. You're in a good place. You're in a good place. Why? Because you're, you, you are right now recognizing your deep, profound, desperate need for God. And that is going to bring the Marcarios into your life. That's going to that's gonna bring this enduring joy that will not be able to be shaken into your life. And that is awesome. That is bigger than that. That is, that is, that is so much better than, than coming to church and getting a goose bump or two and getting some goodies for a little while and then being disappointed because God, it, it turns out not to be who they told you he was. God ain't a sugar daddy. <laughs> Did I read everything I had about mourning? Sensitive to the suffering needs of others. A sense of sorrow for the, for the broken and for the lost. Similar to that of Jesus. And what we say just, I think it was Sunday about, uh, we referred to the, the 99, he would leave the 99 and, and his attention and his care would be focused on the one that was lost. I, I think we need to get some t-shirts made up that just says, I'm the one. They, they may already have them, probably do, but I, I, because we are. Connie, you're, you're the one. You you you. You were, anyway. Now, now you're one of the 99. <laughs> she wasn't the one. You were the one. But it, was anybody else in here the one? Y'all think y'all... We all think we're the one, right? I think the reason for that is because we all were the one at some point in time. I was the only one you wanted to strangle, though. <laughs> I don't know. Have you met... Well, never mind. I was going I was going to point somebody out, but I ain't going to do it. I'm going to try to behave. I'm going to try to behave. David yes. Used the word anguish too. Uh huh. You know, uh, like Nehemiah. Right. When he's in the condition that did, in fact, you just shared it. We talked about that Sunday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's that's a kind of an anguish. That's. That, mm hmm. That's that's the mourning. That's the God. I, I I I. It's breaking my heart to see the condition of our land. It's the condition of our country and and our kids and our adults. I mean. It's just breaking my heart. I, I, I can't hardly stand to watch this happen. But, but when that's your condition, He turns that condition and He comforts you. But you take it to Him. Again, you take it to Him. We keep going back to Psalm 42. As a deer pants for the water. I didn't, I didn't, well, I didn't go there, did I? I thought it. Y'all should have been keeping up. <laughs> As a deer pants for the water. In Psalm 42, I think it's verses 1 and 2. So my soul longs after you. You know, a deer don't pant until after he's chased by an enemy or a predator. He only pants after that. And then 
he gets desperate to find water to replenish himself because of the thirst that's been created. And, and when, when we put ourselves in that, in that scenario and, 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 and make it us and God, when we've been uh, chased, when we've been buffeted, when we've been hammered on, when we've been sifted by the enemy and we are tired and we are weary, just like the deer, we need to be desperate to find him, desperate to get back to him, not, not quick to turn on him. God, why'd you let this happen to me? Not quick to turn on him, not quick to abandon our faith, but desperate to turn to him and to find him because we're hurting, we're weary, we're tired, we're confused, we're, we're exasperated, we're whatever we are. And we know that only he has life. Only He has that water that we can drink and that will sustain us and, and restore us. Verse 5. Any other comments? That's good. Thank you, Brother Ken. Any other comments? Okay. Y'all are thinking, I ain't saying nothing. I'm going to help dude hurry up and get done. The gentle are blessed. So, so, so the poor in spirit the, and those that mourn and the gentle are blessed, for they will inherit the earth. Let's talk about that gentle. Gentle, or King James says meek. We tend to think in our society, in our, our culture, that meek is weak. You know, turn the other cheek. That's a, be, be meek enough to be able to turn the other cheek. Be meek enough to let somebody cuss you out and you not return the favor. Be meek enough to let somebody flip you off or do whatever they think of to do and you choose to not return the favor. But as I've said many times when we talk about this, meekness is far from weakness. If you, if you are meek, you are stronger than the biggest bully out there. If you can maintain a meek attitude, heart, and spirit, meekness is far from weakness. Meekness is great strength restrained. Amen. It's like, I've got it. I could use it, but I'm not going to. You're going to say what you're going to say. You're going to do what you're going to do. I can know you're wrong. I can even draw a boundary. And, and not let you cross it without getting extremely upset and aggressive and violent. It took me way too many years to learn that lesson. But I've learned it. And, and it is, it's freeing. It's like, wow. I can, I can now look at the person who's doing to me like I used to do, and I can mourn. For them. I can pity. I can say, man, I'm glad I'm not there anymore. I'm glad I don't live there anymore. And I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, thank you, God, for, for helping me in my deep, desperate need to get a little more like you. And he's so faithful. He's so faithful to do that. But you know what? You have to want it. For a long time, I said, said I wanted it, kind of prayed for it. Talk, when I was talking to the uh, people that I needed to, you know, look a certain way, act a certain way, I would, I would say, I knew, I, knew, I knew what to say. I was raised in church. I knew what to say. But I really didn't want it because it served me well. And so I kept it. It was a defense mechanism. And most people like that are afraid anyway, like I was. But it helped me to not look afraid. It helped me to not feel afraid. I could, I could fool myself sometimes because I went up against a big guy or I did a hard thing or I did a whatever thing I used to brag about. And now I look at his utter foolishness. But it helped me at the time in the, in the state that I was in, in the frame of mind that I was in. And, but God delivered me. But, God, but when, I, when I saw Jesus and I saw His way and I desired His way, then he helped me to find it. 
So if that, I think maybe that's going to resonate with somebody here tonight. I feel, I feel like it is. When you, when you see His way and you desire His way, you will find His way. As long as it's just something out there that that's what they say I should do, and I know that would probably be good, but you're not going to get there. Not, not as long as you're in that frame of mind. But when you desire it like the deer that pants after the water, then you'll find it. When I was about five years old, my grandfather had a mule that was huge. It was to me because I was little, and he was setting me up on this mule, and he'd use words like yay and nay and, you know, tell him to turn to the right and left. And that mule could have pulled this building down. I mean, he you could see the muscles in him. And, and uh, that defines the word meekness. Great strength, like Brother Chet said. Great strength. Restrained. Restrained, Restrained by God's love. Under orders. Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't move until he was told to move. Yeah. All right. Verse 6. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed because they will be filled. I wrote in my margin here, urgently pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? An easy definition for righteousness is to be in right standing with God. So I've, I've got faith in Him. I believe in Him. I am obedient when He speaks. I'm obedient to Him. I have repented of my sin as far as I know of my sin. What I know, we, you know, we all walk in the light that we have. If, if we don't know, we're not held accountable for certain things. But uh, once I know, once I'm held accountable, uh, then I'm held accountable once I know. And um, I repent of those things. And the Word tells us that in 1 John 1, 9, that when we confess our sins, He uh, is faithful to forgive us of our sins. And He then cleanses us from all unrighteousness because He's faithful. And that puts us in a, if we're cleansed from all unrighteousness, as, as I just said, that puts us in a standing of righteous. righteous. I'm, I am righteous because He's righteous, because He made me righteous. I'm not righteous because I'm good, or I did something you know, good enough, or I earned it, or anything like that, but I'm good because He erased my sin. He forgave my sin because I came to Him and I, with, a, with a repentant heart, and I went another direction. You know, Paul said, Shall we continue in sin that grace abound? God forbid. Um, so we, 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 don't, we don't continue. We don't. I was talking to somebody just a few days ago, and they clearly are in sin according to the Word. And I quoted them the Scripture and, and showed them what Jesus said about their behavior. And they still denied that it was sin. And I said, well, as long as you're denying it, as long as you're running, choosing to live your life running counter to what Jesus says clearly in the Word, then that's going to be between you and Him, and I'm not judging you, and I'm not going to be upset with you, but um, you will be accountable for this. And but, but we, gosh, we are so good, our society is so good at twisting things, and, and, and right has become wrong, and wrong has become right. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous place that we're in when we live when we live there. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness is not my righteousness. It's not the world's righteousness. It's not what the, the society that I live in is accepting of or okay with. It's what God says. It's what He says is right or what He says is wrong. Right? Amen? Amen. Um, the merciful are blessed for they will be shown mercy. That one comes with a promise. And that one uh, is echoed uh, by the Luke a, a, a few a few books over in chapter 6 verse 38 that's echoed by Luke when he says give and it shall be given to you good measure pressed down shaken together running over shall God cause men to give to your bosom so whatever you give is going to be given back to you so if you are merciful mercy will be given to you if you are hateful, hate will be given to you. If you are resentful, resentment will be given to you. If you are loving, lo and, and, and so it goes. Um, 
So that's a principle that no one escapes. Now, it's not one you want, it's not one that you want to escape if you're walking in obedience to the Lord. It's, it's one that's working on your behalf. It's kind of like interest on your money. It's, it's working for you while you sleep and, and, and while you rest and whatever. It's working for you. And, that, and God's principles are working for you when you choose His way. And when you choose to treat people, love people, uh, the way he treated and loved people and expects us to do, when you walk in his commandments and walk in obedience to him, he's working on your behalf. And, and you're not chasing the blessings. The blessings are actually chasing you. And, 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 and who wouldn't enjoy that or love that or want that? So, blessed are those who are merciful. Now, I guess we all remember and know, because I've said it many, many times here, how do we remember what mercy is? A good, easy definition for mercy. Somebody tell me. Grace is what? Grace is getting what you don't, don't deserve. deserve. And what is mercy? Mercy is not, not getting what you do deserve. Exactly. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So if I'm going to be merciful, what am I going to do when you deserve something? You've done something dumb. You've made some kind of stupid blunder. Am I going to give you what you deserve because you deserve it? I mean, you did it. You did the thing. You did the deed. So, no. Mercy is if I'm going to show you mercy, you're going to treat me with, with, with unkindness or hatred or resentment or you're going to talk about me and I'm going to refuse to talk about you. You're going to gossip about me and I'm going to find out about it and it's going to be proven. Or maybe you're going to gossip about me and I'm going to hear it. I'm going to know with 100% certainty that you were and that you were slandering me. And I am then going to, in turn, refuse to do the same thing for you. I'm going to actually do the opposite. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to love you. Jesus goes on in his crash course, intense training session for the discipleship program that he started. Uh, he goes on to say later on, if you uh, love your enemies and do good to those who despitefully use you and bless them who curse you and all, you know, wow. He just set the religious world up on their ear when he, when he brought in the, 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 the new covenant because they're all about what's on the outside. And Jesus was all about what's on the inside. And his laws seem to be upside down uh, and, and were in many cases from those of the Old Testament of the Old Covenant because the Old Testament said an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You bust me in the face, I'm going to bust you in the face. That's just the way this is going to work. And it's going to be considered fair and right and nobody's going to blame us and we're not going to get in trouble. But Jesus said, you bust me in the face, I'm going to not bust you back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love you. I'm going to understand that you're a broken man or woman and I'm going to do everything that I can to help you find healing like I found. Wow. Then I will be blessed. Then I will have an unshakable, enduring joy through my most difficult moments. And people are going to look at me and say, how does he do it? Or look at you and say, how does she do it? Or he, do, you know, it's like, I'm not doing it. He did it. All I'm doing is surrendering. All I am doing is choosing to be meek, choosing to be merciful, choosing to be in right standing, and depending on him to even help me do the thing that I've chosen to do because I couldn't do it on my own. I mean, he set you up to win. But we just got to play by his rules, not the modern church rules, not the world's rules. We just got to play it by his rules. And we're reading those tonight and we're breaking them down. I, I hope it's easy and, and, and easy to remember and, and easy to understand. The gentle are blessed. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful are blessed. For they will be shown mercy. Luke 6.38, if you want to reference anything like that. The pure in heart are blessed. Why does it take to be pure in heart? 
pure in heart, there's, there's a, a, a simple requirement is that we are washed. Our heart, which was dirty and stained and filthy, is washed and made clean. What washes our heart? Blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus shed for us that gives us the ability to go to the Father, understand and know what's expected of us, and the strength to be able to do it. And I find what He expects of me in His Word. Ephesians 5 tells us we're washed by the water of the Word. We, we know what the Word says. We choose to obey the Word, and that purifies our wicked heart. It changes our heart. It, 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 it redirects our will. And now I no longer desire and long to do these things. I desire and long to do His things. And that purifies over time. It purifies my heart. Right? The pure in heart are blessed. Um, let me just read what I wrote by pure in heart in my notes here. Made clean by the Word and His Spirit, staying in a constant state of repentance and receiving His forgiveness. All right, so I'm in a constant state of <laughs> repentance. Now, there are churches out there today teaching you we don't have to repent anymore. There's ministers out there today teaching you don't have to repent anymore. Jesus died for all of our sins once and for all. You, got, you don't have to repent of anything. Well, that's a bunch of malarkey. Um, we have to stay in a constant state of repentance. A constant state of God, expose my heart. Show me what the, the, the wickedness that's in me. Show me the inequity that's in me. Show me the unfairness. Show me the unmercifulness. Show me these things. Cause it to come to the surface. And, 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 and he usually uses people to, to do that. <laughs> so why am I so upset with a person when God sent them to do me a huge favor and I'm getting mad at them? And I'm cussing them out. Can't you just, can't you just, you don't just know God's up there going, oh, come on, Hugh, really? I sent them for you, dude. I mean, to help you. You asked me to help you with this. Here's your help, and now you're cussing them out. You wouldn't do that. I'm just using you as an example because I know I can. <laughs> Not out loud. Okay, still got some work to do because remember, Jesus is focused on the heart, right? Uh <laughs> it's a constant state of repentance and receiving his forgiveness. And that's a, that's a big one. I, I can, some people just repent and repent and repent and repent and then they feel low and they feel defeated and they feel down. After you've repented, receive his forgiveness. After you have gone to the throne of mercy and approached it with boldness like it tells us in Hebrews, after you've done that, know that you have a faithful, loving Father, that you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive them like we said a while ago. And then receive His forgiveness and get out of the trash. Get out of the junk. Walk out of that. Don't, don't lay in that and keep staying in that and keep going back to it. It's, it's worthless to you now. Don't be like a dog that returns to its vomit and say, well, I was this kind of a person. I was horrible and I guess I'm still horrible. You know, no, you're, you're forgiven. If you're not walking in it anymore, you're forgiven and you're clean. If you're not doing it anymore, if it's not rising up in your heart anymore, you're forgiven, you're clean. You're, he's made you in his righteousness and he's making you in his image. And we need to accept that. And we need to walk in that. And we need to hold our head up and not be, you know, deterred by anybody. Or by anything, or any voice that comes to us, right? The pure in heart. Blessed are the... Uh, I wrote these out of order. Um, verse 9 says, peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called the sons of God. A, a peacemaker is a person who is a reconciler. It's a person who... You always see them helping people with their issues and, and helping them with their conflict that's in their relationship and, and eliminating that conflict and getting back on good terms with one another. That's, that's a peacemaker. That's what they do. And they not only do it for other people, like two other people out here or a bunch of a group out here, but they're, they're quick to do it for themselves with other people. They're quick to say, look, man, I'm sorry. I, I spoke out of turn. I... Can you forgive me for that? They're quick to do that. Um, 
they don't try to justify themselves. They don't try to, to make excuse for themselves. They, 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 they recognize where they've, they've erred and they want, they want to make it right. They're, they want to reconcile. They're, they're just reconcilers. They just can't help it. It's in their nature to reconcile because it's God's nature, right? And so when we adopt His uh, character and nature, this is one of the things that, that we will be. So all these things that we've talked about tonight are things that you will be as you become disciples of Christ, true disciples, and go out to preach the gospel, share the gospel, uh, and, and help those that He sends you to. You're gonna ha- these are qualities you're going to have. And the last one is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. If you are persecuted for righteousness, you are you're in good company. If you're mocked, if you're made fun of, if you are rejected, if you're cast aside, if you're left out, um, if people hate you, if people talk bad about you because of your faith, that's persecution. It's mild in the United States right now. If you, um, it's getting worse, but it's mild in the United States compared to what it is in other country. But, but the scripture says, "Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for the kingdom of heaven is yours." And I don't think there's any better promise than that. I don't think there's anything greater that God could do for us when we are insulted, when we are mocked. When we're lied about, um, when 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 we're gossiped about, I mean, there, there's that. That's a person that is. If you if you're persecuted for righteousness, you're already walking in many, if not all, of the first seven that we talked about, and that will bring persecution to you. It'll it'll bring it to you from your own family in, in many cases. It'll certainly bring it to you from strangers that you meet and sometimes, you know, your friends. Um, but remember that they hated Jesus before they hated you. They hated the disciples. They, and it's not you so much that they hate. It's, it's what you stand for. It's who you stand for. It's who you live for. It's that spirit that, that is convicting to them and causes the feelings of guilt and inadequacy that they, they're, they're, they're having a hard time wrapping their head around that and don't want to be around it because it's, it's uncomfortable for them. So understand, you're in a good place, right? You're, you're, you're in a good place. So there's more. I, I didn't do too bad. It's only five after eight. Um, <laughs> there's more um, that could be said about this. But, well, let me just read that last verse. You are blessed when they insult and persecute and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He goes on from there and he talks about being salt and light. And I want to say this one last thing and I'm done. When you, when you live your life according to these beatitudes, you become salt and light. You don't become salt and light just because you started coming to church. You don't become salt and light just because you said, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. That's a wonderful first step. You become salt and light when you become like these eight Beatitudes that we, that we talked about right here tonight. Because that changes the flavor of the world you're in. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for tonight, for all those that are here, for your word. God, it's simple, it's basic, it's, but it is so profound and so, for some of us, difficult to, to, to achieve. And, uh, but God, by the power of your spirit, by the healing that comes from your word, by the help that you give us, God, when we realize our need for you and we, and we thirst for you and we search for you, your word promises that when we search for you with all of our heart, you will be found. Um, and so, God, for every person who's heard this and this resonates with them tonight, I just pray, God, that they they see the need and begin to search for you with all of their heart. And, God, you'll be found by them, and you will. they won't need anybody to teach them this. You will fill their hearts and their minds with it, and they will grow and they'll blossom, and they will then have 
that unshakable, profound joy that is enduring through all things of life, that they, they could leave this place hurting and broken and without, but praising you 100%. And so God, let that be our heart. Let it be our family's heart. Let it be this church's heart. And then let us go out from this place when we leave here and be salt and light in the places you take us. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody agrees. Say amen. amen. Thank you guys. Love you.